At Baptist Health South Florida, it's our mission to care for you when you're injured or sick and help you stay healthy and fit. Welcome to the Baptist Health Talk podcast, where our respected experts bring you timely, practical health and wellness information to improve your family's quality of life. Welcome Baptist Health Talk podcast listeners. I'm your host, Dr. Jonathan Fialco. I'm a preventative cardiologist and lipidologist at Baptist Health's Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute, where I'm also Chief of Cardiology at Baptist Hospital and Chief Population Health Officer at Baptist Health. Our blood vessels are like pipes that carry blood throughout the body. While the arteries carry oxygen-rich blood from the heart to the organs, our veins have the job of taking waste-filled blood back to the heart to complete the circuit. While much attention gets paid to our arteries, especially as the cause of strokes and heart attacks, we don't give a lot of thought to our veins, but we should. Today, I'm happy to welcome two vascular surgeons from the Baptist Health System to tell us why. Dr. Eileen DeGrandis, who's medical director of the Vein Center at Boca Raton Regional Hospital's Christine E. Lynn Heart and Vascular Institute, and Dr. Libby Watch, who's a vascular surgeon and a specialist in veins at the Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute. Thanks for joining us today, guys. Thanks. It's great to be here. Thanks. So let's start with some basics. Uh, Eileen, let's start with um, a question to you. Um, We mentioned veins and arteries. What's the difference? Well, you mentioned before that arteries bring blood down from the heart and veins bring them back up. Arteries are a thicker blood tube that really has some muscle layers to pulsate blood down, hence we have a pulse from the arteries. When we talk about veins going back up, they're a thinner, wild, Um, And they work through valves, which help push blood up one way against gravity uh, to return blood to the heart. Uh, As a result, the disease processes that happen in arteries and veins are slightly different. Arteries will thicken and form plaque. They can also dilate and form aneurysms. But veins, when they have problems, can form clots. um, And they can also primarily dilate to form what we call varicosities. yeah, that, that's that's very helpful. So I think um, they're not just passive tubes going, taking blood in different directions. They're actually structurally different. And and um, um, uh, and as you say, veins have valves. So um, there are differences beyond just the direction the blood's flowing Correct. within them. Fair to say, right? OK, um, so with that level set, um, Libby, um, vein problems, um, are they mostly in the legs and the feet or do they occur in other parts of the body? So you can have vein problems in everywhere in the body, but the majority of the vein disorders that we treat are in the legs and the feet. Um, the veins in the legs and the feet are more susceptible to issues because of gravity and if valves aren't working, the veins will dilate and cause symptoms that, that occur in the lower part of the body more often. There are other malformations that can happen in other parts of the body, but that's the majority of vein issues. Veins are also duplicated, um, different from arteries. Um, There are very few arteries in the body that can be spared, but veins um, tend to be duplicated in the legs. So there are uh, two systems working together. um, And that's why I think more issues occur in the legs and the feet than in the other part of the body. So in your practice, again, uh, while, uh, as you mentioned, uh, both of you guys mentioned there are veins throughout the body that can become problematic, the majority have to do with the lower extremities, the majority have to do with problems in the legs? Yeah. Is that fair to say yeah. to both of you? Yeah. Um, so, so Libby, again, expounding on what you discussed, what are the more common vein problems that one would experience in their legs? So um, we divide the legs, the leg veins into two systems, deep superficial. And so there are veins that clot, and that can lead to deep vein thrombosis in the leg, which is often a serious problem requiring medical treatment, usually not surgical treatment. And then the superficial veins can clot as well, which can cause sort of painful areas, like patients will have a, a big vein that they can see in their leg, and that's painful. So that's a, what's called a phlebitis. And then the uh, most common thing that we treat for uh, venous disease is superficial venous insufficiency, where the superficial veins themselves don't empty blood. They don't return blood to the heart as well as they should. And that can lead to a, a, a number of different symptoms in the legs that people will seek out treatment for. We've actually done a podcast um, regarding um, leg swelling, and obviously a big component of that came up with the veins. So certainly sensitive to, to, to what you're speaking about. Um, I do want us to talk about clots because they're, they're fairly serious. But before we get to that, um, uh, Eileen, let me ask you um, for 
people who may be, let me phrase that, are there people who are predisposed to vein conditions? Are there either genetic or body habitus things which might make someone need to be more alert or uh, more aware of the potential vein problems? Uh, there is definitely a genetic component. A good portion of my patients come in saying their mother, their sisters, their fathers have had vein disease, large varicose veins that were treated or untreated. In terms of uh, a more environmental cause of vein disease, we look at people who are standing all, a lot with uh, who or sitting a lot or are in construction carrying heavy things. Obesity and pregnancy can certainly cause vein disease. What just from the pressure blocking the veins or causing extra weight that your veins have to work against when pushing blood up against gravity. Um, certainly blood clots can themselves damage veins and lead to vein issues um, in the long run and worsening reflux and damaging the valves. Um, one of the newer things that we see causing vein problems and pathology is COVID-19. And this is causing blood clots and uh, thrombotic complications. Um, what uh, it, it, elaborate on that a little bit because it is out there in the um, in, in the in the press and in the community. Um, are you talking about people in an ambulatory home setting, or are you talking about more people who are hospitalized with severe conditions? Are you talking about both? Um, elaborate on that a little bit. Definitely, those who are hospitalized in an ICU setting. There are really good studies showing that the the critically ill, the ICU patients, were on ventilator or what we call BiPAP or assisted breathing device. These patients have a higher risk of thrombotic complications. We're seeing these in veins as well as arteries, so causing heart attacks, causing strokes, causing DVTs. The DVT rate in uh, a number of papers after COVID-19 was discovered demonstrated anywhere between a 20 to 40 percent risk of DVT or incidence, sorry, incidence of DVT in the critically ill and uh, yeah. high population. Um, from a, a less critically ill or the ambulatory um, DVT rates, there is a propensity to be higher, uh, higher risk for DVTs or higher incidence of DVT simply because when you have COVID, you feel terrible and you're not amb and you don't want to ambulate. You're largely more sedentary. The, you're not being able to breathe makes you feel terrible um, and you don't want to move. So the being stationary, less movement, less contraction of legs increases your risk of blood clotting and COVID puts you in that situation. So again, another negative consequence of COVID um, um, that we're dealing with. Um, and that's a great segue um, um, back to Libby uh, regarding blood clots, deep venous thrombosis, major component of, of, uh, of venous uh, disease. Um, what are the more common signs and symptoms of a deep venous thrombosis? When should someone be concerned to say, I need to get this checked out? Yeah, so circumferential swelling and pain, um, any part of the leg is uh, absolutely pain thrombosis. Uh, is it usually, if I can interrupt, is it usually one leg or can it happen in both legs at the same time? It can happen in both legs. It's more common to be uh, one leg at a time. Um, both legs, it's usually a, a problem even higher up in the pelvis um, with, a, uh, with a bigger vein called the inferior vena cava can cause a problem with both legs at the same time. But it's more common just to, to have it in one leg. Um, and I do want to add the, in, in addition to what was mentioned, risk factors for deep vein thrombosis are uh, birth control pills and malignancy as well. So patients who um, have been sick with COVID or are taking birth control pills or um, have malignancy should definitely be on the lookout for these these issues because they can uh, they can be easily treated most of the time. So we want to make sure they're aware of that. But the, again, the circumferential swelling, pain, especially pain with walking uh, immediately upon ambulation, not uh, not pain that gets worse with walking for a long time, are the things to look for. And and so, what's the concern if I got a clot in my leg and it's a little swollen? What's the big deal? So there's. There's short-term and long-term uh, risks. The, uh, the most immediate risk is a clot that's not treated, can get larger, and then can break off from the leg and travel to the lungs. And we call that a pulmonary embolism, and that's um, very dangerous, can be fatal. And we have seen a definite increase in pulmonary emboli during um, this COVID. Um, the long-term sequelae, the long-term complications of having a deep vein thrombosis is the valves in the deep veins can be damaged and patients will have chronic swelling that really doesn't get better. Um, and so patients who have really massive swelling in their legs um, should be treated with a blood thinner 
and with some compression on the leg to prevent those long-term consequences of chronic leg swelling after deep vein thrombosis. So it's pretty clear that anyone that may have or certainly has a blood clot in the leg, a deep venous thrombosis, should seek medical care. No question about it. How urgent should that be? What Should patients at any time you know, rush to an emergency room or are there symptoms where you maybe call your doctor? What, what, what generally, and again, I know it's a tough question, but um, Eileen, what would you recommend would trigger someone to be, what would trigger someone to say, I got to go get this taken care of right now or alternative, uh, alternative methods? I think if patients are having a significant amount of pain, swelling, shortness of breath, definitely pain and swelling, no shortness of breath, call your doctor and see if they can see you today or go into a walk-in clinic. That's the safest thing to do. I definitely would not sit on this, especially overnight, since some of these clots can, it can develop further and break off and go to the lungs at any time. If there's shortness of breath or chest pain, that gives grave concern that some clot has already broken off and gone to the lungs and the heart. So you do want to go to the emergency room at that time. Um, in general, with blood clots, uh, a lot of people think it's a leg cramp and they want to walk it off. It's, if you have a history of being on a flight or having the, the birth control pills or a malignancy or COVID, don't sit on this. I would tell people to go in and it's better to be safe and sorry, get checked. Do you, um, um, and both of you guys alluded to the fact that being stationary for long periods of time can increase the risk of blood clots in the legs. Um, any advice when people have to take a long plane flight? Do you tell, if anyone asks you, is there anything I should do to avoid a blood clot, Eileen? Is there anything you tell them in particular? Uh, I'm a big fan of compression stockings. Um, that can certainly help with um, providing to the veins some external support. Walking around on planes, I don't know if they let you do that anymore. Yeah, yeah. If if that you know seatbelt sign goes off and you want to stretch your legs, walk to the back room. Definitely, if it's a long flight, um, and these things can help. So certainly, people at high risk would really we would really emphasize that being preventative, prophylactic, you know, compression stockings for the flights would help. But good advice for anyone that might be having a, a long flight or even a long drive. Um, all right, let's switch gears again uh, 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 from uh, the disease states and whatnot. There are a lot of these vein clinics out in the community. Um, um, I'm going to ask both of you about this, but Libby, can you can you start by what would be the difference regarding what you guys are doing in a very high end vascular medicine specialist, vein specialist for people with significant medical conditions? What, what, where do those have a place, if any? I think that everybody is born with a saphenous vein, which is a superficial vein. And it's not hard to actually treat the problem. It's not a, um, it's not a, a challenging procedure to perform. It's really important to know when to perform the procedure. So understanding the disease process and making sure, I think the, the biggest thing that I, I do differently from a cosmetic, um, somebody who's treating veins for cosmetic reasons, is I make sure that there's no other underlying problem. I'm going to check your deep and your superficial veins. I'm going to talk to you in real time about the risks and benefits of taking away the saphenous vein if it's not actually causing a problem, treating the saphenous, I'm sorry, treating the superficial veins if it's not really causing the problem. And I would say that's the big difference between seeing a bona fide vascular specialist who can be a vascular surgeon, a vascular medicine specialist. Um, and, uh, and that's what sets us apart, I think, from the cosmetic vein centers. Having said that, um, I do understand the importance of cosmesis and, and um, people not liking how their veins look. Um, and so we do that as well. But making sure that we're not missing some underlying problem is probably the most important thing that we can do as vascular specialists. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, I'll give you a chance to comment, but specifically towards it's not that people who may have a cosmetic issue which triggers an evaluation, but a broader evaluation to make sure it's not due to some underlying medical condition, as well as you can handle the cosmetic situation as well. So maybe I'll just ask you to comment on that further, Eileen. Oh, I agree with everything Dr. Wash said. The, the, the thing to remember too is the veins are part of the entire vascular circuit. And there is a good proportion of people with concomitant arterial disease as well. And I think that's what separates the vascular surgeons and vascular specialists from the cosmetic centers. About 20 to 25% of patients, at least in my practice, who come to me with this vein disease also have arterial disease, and they're treated in a very different manner. And if you miss one and treat the other, um, it, it doesn't always do our patients a service. 
And what I see from a lot of cosmetic centers is they'll address only the veins and the patients won't feel better. And they'll often neglect to ask the important questions, well, what else is really going on? So there's a lot of cardiac issues that cause leg swelling, which is not just the veins. If you don't address that and you just treat the veins, there are issues. As the, card the cardiologists don't really like it, as if we take the sap in this vein and they're going to need that later for a heart bypass, because that's what the, the heart's the real issue that causes the leg discomfort, not really the, the legs. So to comment on Dr. to reinforce Dr. Watch, we really have to look at all of the issues that cause uh, vein symptoms or leg symptoms. So that emphasizes what both of you bring uh, from an expertise, but from an approach to the patient, more holistic, more generally about the patient, not just about the vein, so to speak, um, and using all the resources available in the Baptist Health System to um, uh, provide that care, um, which is, uh, again, well established in your comments. Um, a couple other quick things. What is, what is um, I mean, what's pelvic congestion syndrome? So pelvic congestion syndrome is, for lack of a better word, varicosities in the pelvis. So you can have these big varicose ropey veins in the legs. You can actually develop them. They're um, over, overexcited growth of veins in the pelvic system around the ovarian system, mostly commonly seen in women. Men can have an, this overgrowth of veins in the pelvis as well from tumors or blockages of the out, outflow veins in the pelvis. Uh, it causes feel, feelings of fullness in women. It can cause pain during cramping and, and pain and cramping during menses. Women often get it post, um, post birth or after pregnancy. Uh, so, and it can cause a lot of debility. Imagine having cramps in your pelvis every month that are so debilitating you can't get out of bed or this feeling of fullness that affects your bowel function that and and bloating where you can't wear clothes uh, it, they're all related to a complex venous overgrowth in the abdomen and pelvis that can be treated is it does is it a particular body have this is it more age related is it more related to being overweight or it can happen in any um, at any age and body type it can happen at any age and any body type i do see these mostly postpartum women um, but it's not necessarily so. I also see these in patients who've had tumors resected from their pelvis. So I do see this occasionally in men as well. And, and how is it approached? What can, what, what can you do for these with these people? So, these women? so there's a complex, uh, so we do a full diagnostics uh, review. So Dr. Watch would do this as well. We do ultrasounds of the legs. We look at the flow studies of the veins. We do ultrasounds of the pelvis and sometimes advanced imaging like CT scans or MRI, MRVs of the venous systems. Um, we can take a look at just these pictures to see whether or not there is an overgrowth and abund extra abundant veins that shouldn't be there. From there, we can do more advanced imaging, invasive imaging that can also be tr uh, a treatment modality for us, what we call a venogram. Libby, do you find most patients self-refer with that potential evaluation or are they referred by other doctors who might recognize the patient might have it? I mean, I think it's a mixture of both, but I, I would say the majority of my patients who come in with, with what we call varicose vein complaints are, are self-referred. They, uh, they usually try to do their research and, and see who they want to they wanna go see for this. And that's, I think, you know, they're educated and they have a problem. And a lot of the times they want to understand probably the most important thing that what they have is not life-threatening and they're not at risk of losing their leg. Um, so I do find that self-referring patients who have uh, have done their reading will come in armed with a lot of information. Good, good, good. Which is which is an informed patient is, is certainly desirable. Um, any final comments you guys have? You've given us great information, great context. Um, really appreciate um, you know you're sharing your expertise uh, with us. Um, uh, Eileen, any final comments you want to make to uh, to the listeners? Uh, you know, I think it's really important when people approach their veins just to get as much information as possible about the procedures that you can and should undergo. Um, definitely correlate to see if, is it worth having if you're having a lot of symptoms? Um, should you see a more advanced vascular specialist versus going to a cosmetic center? Um, I think I think getting opinions from your primary care physicians as well and 
and um, even you know, like your OBs or your um, orthopedic specialist is a good idea as opposed to just straight jumping to a vein center. Great. Libby, anything to add? Uh, I'll just put in a plug for uh, our oldest treatment for vein problems, which is compression stocking. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, um, remind people that uh, you can you can get fitted for compression stockings um, and you can wear them on long driving trips, on flights. They will make your legs a class. They're good for putting on after you exercise. And uh, and it's what I recommend. I think all good vascular surgeons is what we recommend to our patients who have uh, superficial vein problems and uh and discomfort from that great great short and long-term benefits of doing such and again i think uh to our to our listeners uh pay attention to your veins <laughs> take care of your veins uh let's not neglect this important part of our our body and our cardiovascular system um thanks again guys i really appreciate it um uh, to our listeners if you have any comments thoughts or ideas for future topics for this podcast please email us at baptist health talk at baptisthealth.net. That's baptisthealthtalk at baptisthealth.net. Thanks for listening, and until next time, stay safe. Find additional valuable health and wellness information on our resource blog at baptisthealth.net slash news. And be sure to interact with us on our social media channels for live and upcoming events. This podcast is brought to you by Baptist Health South Florida, healthcare that cares.